Okay, guys, I'm here today. John Daniel, her huge honor for me, Brian Gleek. And uh, guys, Joy is just starting a new series uh, for older people, and uh, it's called Ageless Jiu Jitsu. And uh, John, can you explain a little more? Super excited about that. And the uh, a big part of our customers is older people. And I think like every Jiu Jitsu school I visit, it's always like 30, 35 years and plus. And, uh, and I think it's different to learn in one instructional video for, for athletes and for those guys who play Jiu-Jitsu as a hobby. So can you explain a little more yeah, what, yeah. You're, what um, you're playing? The, the content of the video is expressly for older athletes and also physically compromised athletes. People who, uh, they might not be old, but they've got something, maybe past injuries or um, they're just not athletically mobile. They just feel they're less flexible. Have less endurance, less physical strength in their training partners. Maybe they just don't come from an athletic background. Remember, there's plenty of people that are young, twenties uh, and thirties, but they just never played sports before, yep. and, and that's a problem. You know, you, you, suddenly at age twenty-eight, you you come in and you, you you're going with guys who have been you know doing wrestling and jiu-jitsu since they were children, and then suddenly you're thrown in there and you're twenty-eight, and you never never even played soccer or something. It's hard. So. Um, it's not only for uh, older athletes, but just basically anyone who feels like their physicality is a little compromised, either by age or some other set of circumstances. And um, uh, I always thought I was peculiarly well qualified to teach this because I'm an old cripple. <laughs> That's um, very true. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so I, I feel like uh, this is something I can I can help people with. I, I started YouTube very late. Uh, yep. I was 28 years old when I started. I started with a crippled leg, and since then. Um, had many physical problems, uh, and of course I'm getting old now. I'm getting yep. towards my 57th birthday. So um, uh, as a result, I think this is a subject I can I can teach pretty well. Um, now, normally, Bernardo, when we uh, do these these YouTube videos, we just go straight to technique. But today, I want to do something a little bit different. I wanted to ask three questions because you're a great teacher too, and and. Um, uh, I'm sure you've, you've thought about this in the past. What would you say, there are three questions I'm gonna ask. The first is, what do you actually lose as you age that's relevant to Jiu-Jitsu? So the first question is, what do you lose? The second question is, what do you keep? And the third question is, what do you gain as you age in Jiu-Jitsu? Okay, so what do you lose, what do you keep, and what do you gain? And uh, I'm curious, Brian. You you teach uh, uh, alongside me for so many years. Like, what do you guys think you lose as you age in terms of jiu-jitsu performance? Probably speed. I, speed I, I totally agree. Speed is absolutely one of the, the goes. Okay. I'm going to throw out the idea of mobility. You know, mobility almost always decreases uh, with age. Flexibility would be another one. Cardio. Cardiovascular strength goes down. Okay. Um, you keep certain kinds of strength, but you definitely lose uh, uh, cardiovascular strength. Now, close to your point, Brian, not only do you lose speed, but I'm going to say you also lose a lot of explosive strength as well. Okay, so I'd say the things you are most likely to lose as you go through the aging process, or you just didn't come from an athletic background, you just had no background in athletics, and now you're trying to start jiu-jitsu, it's going to cost you in terms of cardiovascular endurance, explosive strength, speed, flexibility and mobility. Those are the things you're most likely to lose either because you're getting older or because you had no athletic background and you've been thrown into a room where now you've got to grapple against people who aren't good athletes. Next question, what do you keep? What's the last thing you lose as an older athlete? If those, if those five things are the first things you lose, what are the last things you lose? Things that you keep knowledge. I'm, I'm going to come back to that soon because I actually think you've gained that. Got it. What do you What, what do you keep? I, I mean, I've I've been with plenty of people who are a little bit older who are as as strong at holding yeah as a anyone else. I would agree with you, Brian. I would say that isometric strength is the thing you keep more than anything else. That's the physical attribute that you keep. Okay. In particular, grip strength. Don't you? You. I've gone with people in their seventies who felt like they had the grip of a twenty-year-old. Um, uh, you tend to lose your strength downstairs first. Your legs go pretty quickly, but your upper body holding strength stays for a long, long time. 
and um, I've seen people be very effective at just isometric tension and holding uh, well into their 60s. So um, this, I believe, is the last physical attribute that you leave. And then the interesting question, what do you think you gain as you get older? I'm going to come out and say this first. I think you gain wisdom and patience. Yeah, pa I would things. say patience too. Yeah. 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 As an older athlete, you gain wisdom and patience. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting question. If we have a clear understanding of what we lose, what we gain, and what we keep, we need to build a training program for older athletes based around those three insights. We need to teach a set of techniques that have minimal requirements for explosive strength, cardiovascular endurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as we, as we name them. We need to have a, uh, a training program that focuses on the one thing you get to keep, which is the ability to hold tension in an isometric fashion for long periods of time against younger and fitter, stronger opponents. And you've got to mentally have a game which, and it, not just a game, but a training program that pushes you towards the idea of patience and wisdom. You're going to beat people with tactics rather than physicality. And that's exactly what we try and do in this video. Now, the video is actually part of a series, Bernardo, because this is the first in the series. And we which started off, game. Yes, we started off with no gi. Yep. So there's going to be a gi one and there's going to be a no gi one. And we further divided each into top game and bottom, bottom game. game. So the first video, the one that we're looking at now, is going to be no gi, bottom game. Yep. That will be followed by no gi, top, top game. game. Yep. Then it will be gi, bottom, bottom game, and gi, gi top, top game. game. Because uh, I generally find with older athletes, they generally favor gi training just as much as they do no gi. Um, yep. Younger athletes typically yep. like the no gi stuff more, um, but uh, I generally find people over 30 typically uh, like to play more of the gi games. It does slow things down a little bit more. So I wanted to do both gi and no gi for this. Yep. Yep. And, um, uh, but today we're focused on the idea of the no gi bottom game. Now, getting back to our insights about what we keep, what we lose, and what we, uh, uh, and what we gain, one of the major messages of this video is the idea that if we're going to slow down, control, and overcome people who are younger, fitter, and more athletic than ourselves, you're going to do it through close body contact. The more contact and connection you have with your opponent, the more you can determine and control where their body moves. So the whole uh, notion in this video is to funnel your training and your game towards scenarios where you maximize body connection to your opponent. Now, it can't just be naive body connection. If you're in the bottom mounted position, you've got, a lot of, you've got a lot of body contact with your opponent, but it's not good. So it has to be advantageous body connection. And uh, that's exactly what we show in this video. We look at the idea of survival skills. As an older athlete, one of the first things you, you start running into is the problem of bad starts. When everyone else is younger, faster, and fitter than you, very often they get the first shot and you have to be able to dig yourself out of a bad situation. So the first skill we look at is survival skills. We just get put in a terrible situation, bottom mount, bottom rear mount, et cetera, et cetera, and you've got to dig yourself out of there. So we show how to survive and frustrate a younger, fitter opponent who's trying to attack you from an advantageous position, hold off his attacks long enough to frustrate him, and then work your way back into a situation where you have so much body contact with your opponent and it's advantageous on your part that you can slow them down, control things, and start to use your best weapons, which is your patience and your tactics, your wisdom, your grappling wisdom. Almost everything we do pushes and funnels the game towards half guard scenarios, because half guard is the position which requires the least in terms of flexibility, body movement, explosive strength, etc. It's where isometric strength is, is used. You hold on and connect your opponent and maximize connection between your body and his. And as a result, you can slow things down. That's when you start wearing people down, controlling them, and getting to your finishes. Now, with regards to finishes, we have to be very careful what we looked at there, because a lot of finishes do require flexibility. There's certain kinds of arm locks where you've got to be able to spin and vert and move around, and these are not applicable to, a, to an older athlete. So we were very careful in our selection for submission hold. They all had to pass a test that they didn't require you to be able to invert and come up onto your shoulders. That they, someone in their mid 50s could apply these quite successfully, and they were all centered around isometric tension and holding, so that 
old way yeah. to excel on them. No, and also like uh, uh, one thing I see a lot about the old guys is that they're a lot less risk takers than the younger yes. ones. So I think the yeah. yes, you typically find that as people get older, they become much more risk averse. Yeah, that's because when things go wrong for an older athlete, they tend to it's harder for them to yeah. recover. Yeah, and that goes back to our point about survival skills. Yeah, you've got to teach them how to survive first, so yeah. that they become less risk averse. Um, for a younger, fitter, explosive athlete, you can get into a bad situation, you, just explode yeah, your way out yeah, and, and yeah. everything's fine. Older athletes don't really have that option. So when they do attack, it has to be a very high percentage attack. Yeah, very precise. going to get them in trouble. Yeah. Um, so Brian, let's start off with some ideas here in terms of um, uh, close body contact. If we're gonna work out of half guard situations, we want to be able to tie up as much of their body as possible. The beauty of so many of the, the standard half guard positions is they create contact over the whole length of your opponent's body, all the way down from the ankle to the hips, to the head and shoulders is being controlled by my body position. I'm in contact with my opponent with the entire left side of my body. And as I bring my arm inside, now we get the right side as well. Okay, and you've got contact inside both of your training partner's legs, all the way from his right ankle, all the way up to his head and shoulders with my head and arms in like so. And it's from situations like this that we can get underneath the training partner's center of gravity. As he goes to base movement situations like this, now he's 100% on the defense. Now what kind of strength are we exhibiting here, Bernardo? This is all isometric strength. This yep. is people up all the way up into their 60s can exhibit this with, yep. with, with no problems, okay? It doesn't take a lot of strength and explosiveness to be effective in this position. In order to be effective, all I have to be able to do is rotate small, amounts to left and right to be able to move his body. In order to be able to go uh, out from underneath him, I just have to be able to move my body up to an angle. Okay, these, these are not big explosive movements. If he goes to put a wizard back in place, wizard back in place, and from here, we're, we're ready to go in and start renewing our attacks. Okay, there's just so much body contact. If we elect to come up onto our base, it's not a difficult thing. There's still so much body contact. Leg to leg, you're controlling your training partner's hip. If he goes to whip me back down to the floor from here, you can just go right back and into that same position we were just in. And it's from situations like this that we can just manipulate someone's body with, playing between supine positions and coming back up. Okay, and it's from here that there's so much body contact. It's going to be very, very hard for opponents to use whatever explosive strength advantages, et cetera, et cetera, that they had. So the whole thing is to funnel the game in towards half guard positions. Once we get to those half guard positions, it's about overturning your opponent and getting up on top. Um, interestingly, for Nogi, we're not gonna focus too much on closed guard because to be effective Nogi with closed guard typically requires quite a bit of flexibility and the ability to come up on your shoulders. Interestingly, with the Gi, Later on, we will be looking at closed guard because then you can start using the collar a lot more, and that uh, will make it much more advantageous. Yeah, and I think like uh, with the gi, it's a lot easier to close the guard yes. than no gi, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. oh, Joe, so, it's, so it's, that, this is very very interesting. So for old guys, no gi on the bar, you would suggest the half guard. Yes, I got it. Yeah, almost the, uh, the whole game in this video is to funnel everything towards half guard. So every escape leads to half guard. Yep. And then we create situations where we're affected from every kind of half guard. We just looked at a tight waist variation, but we're gonna be effective too in situations where he has the underhook. And okay. from here, we still need to be effective. And yep. we look at off balancing people from positions like this and creating situations where as they come back up, now you've got the kind of body contact you need to be effective with. Right. So regardless of whether we have underhook or overhook, all we need is body contact. Right. We've got the majority of the surface here of our body in contact with his, and it's advantageous on our part, you're gonna to be able to beat younger, stronger athletes. So the whole game is to take crisis situations where you can survive long enough, you're not gonna get beaten in the first 30 seconds, you can hold on, slow things down, and start to use that wisdom and patience to work your way patiently back into the half guard. Regardless of how your opponent is holding you, under hook or over hook, we have to be effective from there. And we've seen this idea that from half guard, there's so much body contact between you and your opponent that the whole game slows down. And that's where older athletes or people who are less athletic can start to win. They use time as a weapon, slow things down, frustrate people, and uh, ultimately turn them over and move <coughs> on to submission holds. All the submission holds we look at are relatively 
uh, uh, they're very, very forgiving in terms of the creep rates. Right? <laughs> None of them require you to go, to go up onto the points of your shoulders and invert and spin underneath people. They're things that people who are older or have no athletic pedigree could easily incorporate. Good. Yeah, so, oh, Joe, so I'm curious about the submissions from the Boron game. Because I can expect the ones from the from the top game, which one you would pick for the old guys, but from on the bottom game, which one can you give an example yeah, of yeah, this submission yeah, that's yeah. Okay. In a situation where a guy's here working inside my closed guard, a standard jujigatami in these kinds of situations will require quite a bit of flexibility to be able to move yep. out on our training partner. Okay, as he tries right. to work, this kind of been, requires me to come up on the points of my shoulders. Okay? And from situations where we start off like so, it might take quite a bit of flexibility better to go into this. Yep. If he pulls his arm out, and we elect to go into a triangle from this position. Again, these are things that require quite a bit of flexibility. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay? So things like that were rejected in favor of situations where we could go, for example, oh, yeah. ure gatame. And ure gatame, from here, the only movement required is a short, shallow one out to the side. Good. Okay, someone in their 60s can easily get into a position like this. There's no inversion, it's just your two knees isometrically tense, locking up, and going into and situations where from here we go on Good. the attack. Okay, lying on your side is not physically challenging at all. Okay, the things we're trying to avoid are those which require some kind of inversion up onto the points of your Good. shoulders. These are more difficult for older or less athletic people. But the idea of just getting to an underhook on someone, and from here, employing Ure Gatame. This anyone can do at any right. given moment. And it's based on the idea of isometric tension that locks our opponent's head in place between our knees, and from here, we're ready to go, okay? So all the ones selected were ones with minimum requirements of flexibility. Good, good. I would expect that maybe Kibura might be... Uh, not so much from bottom position. We did some out from half guard, oh. but um, uh, for example, the, the standard Kimura from half guard was covered, because really very little is involved. Sure. Once you get the hand behind the back, really yeah. the onus yeah. is on him now to move. As he goes into a defensive role, we just follow them up and over. So that was incorporated because it required no flexibility whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. But other forms of Kimura, say for example he locks his hands defensively, where we have to start whipping our body around the corner and taking people over. These do require more flexibility. And again, I don't think they're going to be appropriate for someone who has no athletic pedigree or was in their late 50s. So some variations of Kimura were left out, but those that required no special skills of inversion or some kind of radical body movement, um, uh, those were left in. Got it. And uh, John, one personal question here. So every very old guy that I train with in Jiu Jitsu, Sooner or later, they do the. I forgot how people call this. The the half guard thing here that, that locks oh, the yes, leg. Yes. Yeah. So is that what's your yes, thinking I, about I, that? I, I like you know, it. How, how do they call that? I forgot the name. Like uh, when they stretch the leg. You're talking about a scorpion or a scorpion. scorpion. Yeah. Yeah. Lockdown. Yeah. 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 The lockdown in yeah. California for a lockdown. Yeah. So yeah. The, what's your thinking about that um, position for? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, it's a position I used to uh, make use of a lot uh, many years ago because it's very good for stopping initial entries into leg locks. Okay. If you've got a guy in half guard top who likes to back step into leg locks um, or swing his leg around yours, I would use it to shut people down from doing that. Um, but the only time I uh, see it as a, a truly valuable position is when you combine it with a scoop grip. So. It, it's almost like every yeah. time I wrote someone that's over just, 55, yeah. I expected that they would yeah, try yeah. to do that at some point. Just by itself, okay, just, just yep. Yep. holding here, it doesn't do a lot of good. It's very easy for Brian to just take his foot up to his buttocks, weaken the connection, and then take okay. his foot inside mine, so I can't follow him, and then start passing. It's also very easy for Brian to take his heel and put it underneath my two heels, push up, disconnect, and then from here straight through, foot goes inside, and pass the side position. Okay, so just by itself, it doesn't do a lot of good to get someone who knows what they're doing. However, if we have our arms underneath his, and we lock things up, and then from this position, we start elevating our opponent's weight up onto his hands, and get into this position. Now it's useful. Yeah. 
Okay, there's a whole bunch of leg locks we can enter into from this position. There's a whole bunch of useful sweeps. Um, the sweep from here, just keep your legs. The sweep from here can be very useful, but the finishing to them can be challenging for older athletes. Because from here, he's gonna be trying to push and walk into you, and now you're in a situation where it's his ability to go into you versus your ability to heist. And so for some athletically compromised athletes, this could be a tough battle to win. Okay, yeah. so um, uh, I, I would, I definitely have taught those in the past in videos, but uh, I, I, I don't see many 55 year old athletes yeah, right. coming up Taking on a 20 year old and, and okay. putting them down with this method. Right. It's their hit highest versus the other guy's ability to sprawl on them. And it's gonna be tough for a 55 year old man to win that battle. So um, I didn't incorporate uh, scorpion work in this video. No, I got it. Yeah, but I'm super happy that you're doing this series because I think that's something that everybody needs, especially for no gi. Because I think like no gi is training, training, training. Yes. And nobody ever thought how to deal the, with yeah, the, no the, gi for the, older um, people, you know. Like. The, the big sort of preconception is that no gi is the young athletic person's game. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you even do see a, a generational change in jiu-jitsu. Like, most of the new generation in Jiu-Jitsu, they train exclusively no gi. Yep. And um, when you go to like a, uh, a local Jiu-Jitsu school, you typically see the older people train in the gi. There yep. is kind of a generational thing. But it's, 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 but it's changing yep. over time. And now the game is definitely going towards no gi. Yep. And um, many of the older or less athletic people in the sport are like, oh man, this is gonna be tough. Like I'm the least athletic person in the gym. Can I keep up with this? And so I wanted to create a training program for people yeah, who were well, either older or came from no athletic great, background yeah, yeah. to make themselves much more competitive in no gi training. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah, so guys, John is just starting this series. So the no gi borrow game is the first part of the series, and it's gonna be at bjjfanatics.com very soon. Maybe by the time you're watching this video, it's already there. So make sure to check that out. And uh, thanks so much, John. My pleasure. It. Thank you, Brad. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe. And to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.